Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. As uh, we were just, uh, we were told, uh, my name is Boris Varinov. I work for ADP, and you're probably familiar with the company because you're receiving uh, paychecks with the ADP logo on it. But ADP is by far more than just payroll company. Uh, ADP has a, a, a representations in more than 140 countries, serving almost three quarters of a million of clients, and offers a broad variety of products ranging all the way from hiring somebody in a workspace until the retirement. Okay, uh, today's agenda would be to, to go about ADP API journey, uh, also to see how the federated design is being used to uh, build API specifications, and also talking about API registry, which is the centralized system that manages API specifications. Uh, ADP strength is data. We always say that data is our middle name, automatic data processing. So we, as I said, we cover a broad variety of areas within the human capital management domain. That includes all the, as I said, everything from hiring somebody actually looking for a job until somebody is ready for retire, and, all, and, and also taxations. So, and everything is connected through the APIs. So let's take a look at the ADP uh, API journey. Before working for enterprise architecture, I was actually part of the ADP Innovation Labs, and that's where the API journey has begun. Uh, one of my colleagues who still works for Innovation Labs was presenting in a conference, and he was asked the question, how can put ADP and innovation in the same sentence? I mean, ADP has a reputation of being a very conservative company. Well, I have to say that for the past probably 10 years, ADP has been transforming from a service company that using technology into a technology company that provides services. And I think we've been quite successful on this path. As a technology company, ADP grew through acquisitions, often acquiring the comp smaller companies with their own product and uh, with their own client base. As a result, there is a variety of products in the ADP ecosystems, often built using different products and different platforms and technologies. And as a result, it's very difficult to integrate across multiple products. I mean, somebody is built on one platform, somebody is another one, and, you know, not everybody is willing to adapt to a different platform. So the natural answer was, okay, let's do the APIs. Let's make sure that every product talks to each other, talks to other consumers through the APIs. And that was the idea. In a high level, again, when we started about 10 years ago, uh, the APIs were used for data synchronization within the company. Uh, then ADP went mobile. So uh, as again, as a part of the innovation labs, that's where ADP was, the ADP mobile was developed uh, with the total, I would say, from inception to the first production about nine months, which is pretty aggressive for a company of this size. Uh, next step was to let's try to sell our data and services outside, meaning that ADP offering a variety of products but it also provides the services. If any partner, ADP partner, wants to consume their data and serve their own customers, we can do it. So we open the marketplace where the data is served through the APIs. And APIs actually started monetizing, started bringing money into the company. Uh, we played with different patterns, different API and UX patterns, and currently we're going through the complete digital transformation where we're actually uh, using the lessons that we learned in the past and reviewing how capabilities we sent and reviewing the API platforms and technologies. As a company, we adapted to the API-first design. I don't think I need to convince anybody in this room that what is API-first design and why it's beneficial, but I would have to say that within our company, we had some hard time initially, because many teams would prefer, you know, like developers often think of documentation as something that needs to be done or may not need to be done at all, or should be done after the fact. So everybody, or not everybody, but many teams would prefer to write their code first, to do the deployment, and then finally generate somewhat, somehow, uh, specification using any of the existing frameworks. Again, with the API first, specification comes before implementation. We want to make sure that our APIs are mapped to particular business cases. Uh, Again, the mentality very often, here's my backend, here's my UI, it has five fields in the UI, let's build an API that has five fields. 
Uh, the, the fact that a different UI can have different set of fields, a different number, nobody paid attention to it. As I said, again, ADP products have a broad variety, acquired through the different smaller companies. Very often the overlap, so it's the same product, I mean, different products can serve companies of different size, sizes. So we want to ensure that the same look and feel, and there is, uh, if there is an API that serves certain capability, it's consistent throughout the products. And examples of the business use cases rather than UI would be just you know what you're doing in a workspace. You promote a work, you create a dependent, you change your personal address, you change your name, something like this. APIs design, we won't design APIs for long life. What's happening in today's fast-changing world that very often API is designed and become any application, as a matter of fact, is designed and becomes obsolete before it goes to production. It's reality. So what we want to do, we want to invest a little bit more time up front to make sure we do sufficient analysis and design the APIs so they can have a longer life. APIs want to be self-descriptive. We don't want to generate tons of documentation. We don't want to, I mean, write tons of documentation. We want to make sure that APIs are readable and they can be consumed by developers, they can be consumed by the business people, the self-descriptive self and often testable, actually always testable. And again, the last point here is actually supporting the first point. We do want to support code generation from the specification, not the other way around. We don't want to generate specification. We want to generate code from specification. And most importantly, the most important point here, the API specification is a contract. So once the specification is defined, uh, both pro API pro provider, API producer team, and the API consumer team can work in parallel and develop their code, to develop their applications to consume or produce API. Well, we started on this journey, and as I said, variety of products, variety of teams, many of them operating in silos, very large companies, 60,000 people, lots of products, so different formats, Throughout, everybody's writing specifications, but everybody's writing in a different format. You name it, cocktail napkins including. So, and more, more, and more. And as a result, there is a slight disconnect. And many of us probably found ourselves in the position when you build something, but the other side cannot consume it. And that's also what's happening very often, or at least initially. So, naturally, what's the next step? Let's do some governance. We need an API governance. It's a large company, again, variety of products, variety of business line, lines of businesses, uh, often operating from the top to bottom by under their own management. So what are the basic principles of the API governance that we adapted? Uh, the canonical API, so one capability, one API. And I was talking about this already. So we want to adapt to a standard specification format. We don't want a cocktail napkins anymore. Enough is enough. Uh, so we want to support event sourcing. This is something that is very important because it's very helpful for the audit. Uh, it's very helpful for downstream integration. Also, very important if you want to build an application Facebook style, where actually your, what you do is a timeline continuum. And that's what would, uh, event sourcing would allow you to do. So basically, once the backend receives any request, unless it's a read request, or even sometimes in a read request, it would, after processing it, it would emit an event, and this event would go to the service broker or event broker, where it can be persisted and later queried for a variety of reasons. And here's the basic diagram that actually uh, demonstrates where, as you can see, API consumer makes a call, provider uh, makes update, then publishes event to the event manager or event broker, whatever you call it, and then uh, most importantly, the event manager would persist the event, and then deliver it to the subscribers. I used the word canonical a few times. In our world, it's a very popular, popular world. Um, so what makes an API canonical, at least in our definition? Uh, API maps to a specific capability. So as I said, it, does, it doesn't map to the UI, it doesn't map to very small actions. Sometimes it could be, but very often it, uh, there is a capability map, and API should reflect this capability. Uh, service endpoints follow the standard URI patterns. Why do we want to do this? Again, ADP constantly acquire companies. ADP acquire, uh, receives new clients. So if the, the, even the same client, once the company grows, it can switch from one backend provider to another backend provider without ADP. 
And we don't want to make the experience so that, let's say, you now you exceed whatever, 150 people. Now you switch into to a different provider. Guess what? You have to re-implement every single API just because it's a different backend that provides you functionality. We don't want this. Uh, the same principle, again, we follow the logical domain model that is defined and uh, making sure that APIs are uh, APIs defined, the API payload follows the naming conventions and uh, using uh, standard reusable components. I'm going to be talking about components for a while and I'm going to talk about schema, but this is something just to highlight. Uh, API supports standard HTTP headers and responses, again, for the same reason. We want to make it consistent. And API specifications follow the standard format. Now, what in our world, and again, not just in our world, but basically, what are the components of the API specifications? We kind of separated them, although really they're inseparable. So we use the uh, open API specs, formerly known as Swagger, as the entry point to our specification where uh, the URIs, headers, parameters, and response codes are defined. Uh, we extended Swagger to support uh, the object mod uh, different UML uh, artifacts where actually you can provide the object model in sequence. JSON schema. I've been to many conferences in the past few years, API related, and very often, the importance of JSON schema is very much downplayed. Everybody is talking about overall, but nobody pays attention. The thing is that most of us, I assume, work in industries that somewhat, some, some heavy, sometimes not so heavy, heavily regulated. Banking, healthcare, you know, payroll, human resources, it's all regulated. So it's very important that we, we expose the APIs, especially to the outside world. We want to make sure that this is something that we can stand behind, that the data is actually governed and the structure, we control the structure. Because it's not just a free world, we can, you know, expose our data, do whatever you want. I mean, the real life is behind this data. And last but not least is the JSON example, where actually you can use to illustrate any particular use case or any particular scenarios. Uh, when we started, we did it with the centralized. And by the way, speaking of JSON schema, I just want to say that I was very pleased that uh, when I came to this conference and for today's just morning, I heard JSON schema so many more times, actually probably more than combined over the past few conferences. So I guess that there is a right audience here. Now, centralized, we started with a centralized API design team where the team would actually collect the requirements from different teams, different products. Uh, evaluate design by various product teams. Again, different products, different lines of businesses, sometimes overlapping. We want to make sure we design an API that can be reusable. Uh, define JSON schema URIs and publish maintenance specifications. Started great, everything was fine. Then everybody, different teams slowly started getting up to speed, and that's what happened. A centralized design team has become a bottleneck. People were waiting escalating, screaming, you name it, or very often just going around. So the next question was how we can scale it. In today's world, very often, I'm actually very popular model is open source. So a lot of companies, a lot of uh, software is being developed using the open source. Well, within a given company, it's called inner sourcing. So basically we are doing open source, but within the company. And also very important what we want to make sure, how much governance and how much guidance we have. It's very easy to, well, relatively easy to push the very strict governance down, but will it work in a large company with a lot of businesses, lines of businesses where actually, again, they have their own management? Unlikely. Uh, people will just go around it. So this is just a kind of a diagram that represents the model, how we want to do this. And again, very important. I'm talking specifically about API specifications. I'm not talking about implementations, building uh, endpoints, building the code to execute a building. I mean, it's all provided through the code generation, or at least the stubs are provided through the code generation. But the topic of this discussion is API specifications. So how, how we would try to do this? We would have a subject matter experts from different domains working with their development teams, develop architects, they would uh, have the proposed API design specification, they would submit it uh, through the uh, git pull requests, we would review this, uh, just centralized team would review this, and either send back or provide comments and, and or in, include it in the standardized and standard library. Um, so what did API governance or 
maybe guidance, I'm not sure what's the right word here, uh, would do. We would maintain logical domain model. Uh, it would define specification schema templates. Again, it's actually very interesting. Uh, during today's keynote presentation, Yuri from MuleSoft was talking about uh, many things that I have actually mentioned here, and it kind of made me feel bad initially. Hmm, he's already talking about this. And what am I going to repeat it? But then actually I thought about this and I thought maybe it's not that bad because somebody's talking about this in a conference and we're already doing it. Maybe it's, again, maybe we're doing something right. Who knows? So we define specification and schema templates. We define reusable JSON component library. Again, what we want to do, we want to provide consistent look and feel. So how do you provide consistent look and feel? You have a reusable components, uh, building blocks that are being used to define your APIs. Can they cover 100% of all scenarios? Of course not. But they, they give a very good foundation in this library. And I'll talk a little bit about this library later. But this library is not just a built in stone. This living and breeding organism. So we publish uh, guidelines, procedures, and acceptance criteria. Very important for teams to know what is that needed to be done in order for their design to be accepted. And educate and guide product teams. Again, everybody knows no matter how good your uh, documentation is, not everybody reads it. So we had a lot of walkthroughs, a lot of workshops just to educate the teams and see how it can be done. I would manage Git repositories and pull requests and eventually publish the API specifications. So that's what governance team was doing. And again, the product of the govern of the API uh, governance in this case is just making sure building the proper specifications. The teams are still responsible for following the specifications, both on the provider and consumer end, but the specification is important. Template. I mentioned about template. Uh, this is something that helps team to actually start developing their almost jumpstart their development. So what we, this is just an example of small snippet of the Swagger. Uh, oh, here, Open API. Sorry if I'm using Swagger incorrectly. I know it's called Open API now. Uh, so this is represented as JSON. And uh, it just shows that you know, certain sections for the interest of saving space are just collapsed a lot of uh, components here, a lot of sections here. But the idea is provide general information, tags, different URIs, so the URIs already have placeholders and the, all the teams need to do is just to fill those placeholders and predefine standard com, uh, responses, parameters, and request bodies. We're also using, again, every API that updates the data has to emit an event. So what we do here, we also have an event, predefined event APIs. Uh, good to know that, you know, once this template is defined, it's loadable, in any Swagger compatible viewer, this is just a standard uh, Open API Specs editor that is available online. What we did also, we extended it to support additional attributes, support additional sections. We actually work very close uh, at some point with the, with the Smart Bear who owns Open API Specs, or actually manages them rather than owns. Uh, and uh, so we developed something which is not shown here. It's a topic for a completely different. Uh, discussion, but uh, we have a lot of extensions that actually support certain elements that are not supported by default. So the product team, the uh, federated product team, their job is becomes, again, if they follow guidelines, follow specifications, become relatively simple. So define JSON schemas and, and samples, swagger documents, and submit pull requests to, I mean, uh, to the uh, repository. So I mentioned already about JSON reu reusable component library. So uh, this has been developed over the course of many years. Uh, very important, we want to provide a consistent look and feel. Why do we want to provide consistent look and feel? As I said before, the um, consumer can switch from one backend to another. We want to make sure that it's not the consumer is not going to go through different learning experience. Consumer can purchase different ADP products if they originally purchased, let's say, just HR services, now they want to purchase benefits and payroll or vice versa, they don't want to relearn the philosophy behind the APIs. So we do want to make sure that it's consistent across the board. So the library is developed over the past five years. Currently, it has more than 700 different components, building blocks. As I said, living and breeding organisms, so if there is new component needed, the teams can submit a pull request. Pull request would be reviewed and component will be included. It's indexed and searchable. 
so the teams can actually search through the component library and to make sure that they don't reinvent the wheel. And again, we often refer to them as a Lego blocks. If you have a pile of Lego blocks, you can build a, a staircase, so you can build the entire house. So, and that's what, how we treat our component library. So it is a building blocks. If you need something that you don't have, you can always add it. Uh, components are being referenced. So when we design our schemas, they're referenced from the, uh, from the schema definition. As you can see here is a very simple example of the uh, person structure where it has name, gender, birth date, etc. So it's kind of reusable across the board. But um, just in case, if you need to define more advanced component that using the same base, we use extension. So basically, it, we combine the base stack with additional properties should the HR system or any a different application that is using the same component it needs to describe a person with additional attributes, you can use it as well. A uh, couple words about API registry. Um, we have a centralized repository for all our specification across the company. So uh, what it is, is may, I want to make sure it's machine readable. When we build the API specification, it's not just for the API designers or, uh, or developers to view it. It's also we want to make sure it's machine readable so we can take full advantage of the uh, standards. So to some extent, it's treated as code. We send it through built-in packaging process. Now, what does it mean, sending specification through built-in packaging process? Well, again, since it's treated as a code, it can be deployed to different environments, so different uh, in infrastructure components can use it in lower and high, uh, in higher environments. Also, what we do during the publication, we do additional things. We uh, generate meta uh, information around the API, which is programmatically generated. Again, that is some topic for a different discussion. Uh, we also do so-called flattening. In other words, so we flatten the schemas, so if somebody wants to download the schema, uh, they can download as a single file because otherwise they would have to download the entire library of reusable components. Uh, different platforms, as for instance, HR Open, uh, which, is provide, which provides a library of reusable components, they require the entire library to be reload, to loaded. We pr think that f it's easier for a consumer to load a single file where actually all the references are included as opposed to load the many megabytes of data. Uh, deployed, as I said, to multiple environments and used by the infrastructure components. So what infrastructure components? For instance, the service broker or uh, event broker uh, by API registry, API, I'm, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not API registry, API proxy that is responsible for authorization and routing of the requests and also by the marketplace. And as I said, we're monetizing APIs. So the APIs are being available on the marketplace for the external consumers. So this infrastructure is using it as well. Uh, often have a discussion. So what is that? What is specification? Is it code or documentation? Different people treat it differently. And in our opinion, this is, it's both. So for API designers, if somebody wants to read it, it's a documentation. If you want to use it to automate your infrastructure, then it's a code. Uh, you already so a similar uh, diagram that shows how the different subject matter experts from different domains submit their uh, proposed designs into the repository. But this repository does not exist in a, in a vacuum. It actually drives, it feeds the API registry. And the API registry has a hub UI where actually the people can, or designers can go find their API, find the specification, find the, whoever did this, uh, find the, what are the APIs available to cover certain domain? There is index search there. And also it exposes interface to make sure the programmatic APIs or APIs to uh, enable programmatic access to the service bus, to the API proxy and marketplace. So our infrastructure is being driven by this specification. So the moment somebody submitted pull request, this pull request has been approved, it's merged. Next Friday, it's available in the registry, or actually Friday of the current week, it's available in the registry. So it's immediately available on the Hub UI. It's immediately available to the infrastructure components. Uh, here's a few stats when we started the federated mode a few months ago, so what, eight, nine months ago. And the red bar represents the federated, so the efficiency of the design has improved. Yes, there were some uh, hiccups initially, but who doesn't have it? And uh, 
So there was some, uh, we learn as we go, and, but I think overall production rate of the APIs has increased. Uh, here's just the top five points, the top five lessons that we learned over the journey. Uh, define API specification first. Inve in, uh, invest into the API first design. It really pays back. Collaborate and contribute. No matter how smart and educated your centralized team is, in large company, it cannot re be responsible for the entire API design. It is, uh, they just simply don't have enough expertise to do that. So you, but you certainly have a talent within the company and the talent, use this talent. Use the open source or inner source. Maintain consistent API look and feel. Invest in standards, invest in the library, invest into something that you can reuse and again, provide the, provide a consistent look and feel. Guide rather than govern. Actually, you need to do both to some extent, but think of it this way. If you have a team that feels that they contribute to the standard, it's much more likely they will follow the standard as opposed to if you just push the standard onto the team, most likely the team will try to find the, their ways around it. And don't just use API specification as the documentation, use it to drive your infrastructure. This is machine readable, use it and uh, take advantage of it. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And again, if you have any questions, I don't know if you have time for it or not, but I really appreciate you listening. Thank you very much. Do we have time for one question while we change out uh, speakers? Give her a chance to dash up to the... Hi. Um, over here on the, I guess, your left in the back corner. There you go. Cool. Um, I was interested in, you said um, that you had extended Swagger to support object model and schema using UML. I was wondering if you could uh, offer any insight into that. I'm sorry, I think in, I, I missed that. In, I missed in one of your slides or early on, yes, I, you'd indicated that you had um, extended OAS mm -hmm. to support object model and schema using UML? Well, it's basically what it does. It allows you to attach uh, any number of the images. So yeah, you have to, uh, it's not a direct integration with UML. It's more uh, representation of the UML as an image. So after you do this, you save it as an image, then you can attach. So your, your viewer, what we did, we not just extended uh, Swagger uh, specification, we extended the UI. So now in UI, you can present this uh, graphical view of your UML model or, or sequence diagrams. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Boris. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.